he had got to specific areas, he couldn't wait for the real thing. I'm not going to wait for it. I will only lay down a thing in the most trusted, most restored place, in the cave of simplicity. And they realized that they would slay me. The secret of cell reproduction. <coughs> you can multiply the cell groups. <coughs> okay, so um, those three guys were uh, involved um, deeply in the discovery of DNA and understanding how the structure of DNA leads to its eventual function. <coughs> and so, by just by way of review, I'm sure this uh, you, you've all gone over this before, but I'm going to do it again just so that everybody's on the same page and we know what we're dealing with here. So, um, what uh, emerged from Watson and Crick and then uh, another 50 years of studies after them uh, is this concept of the central dogma. And uh, in the central dogma, as you probably know, um, DNA. Uh, uh, encodes RNA, and RNA then encodes uh, protein. And so information flows from the DNA to the protein. And so when you're working on plants or in people or whatever, the same paradigm holds. Uh, and so <clears throat> it's important to, uh, when you start thinking about genetics, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it's important to know uh, terms. And so in this uh, image that I'm showing on the screen, you know, this cartoon of the DNA, one of the strands is, uh, is, is called the template strand. Anybody want to guess which one it is? it is? Is it A, B, or C is the template strand? Is there anybody who wants to call out an answer? No. Sorry, I couldn't hear. B is the template strand. Correct. So, so <clears throat> the top strand is referred to as the coding strand, and the bottom one is referred to as the template. And that's because DNA is um, is uh, an anti-parallel uh, structure in which um, the, the sequences of the A strand and the B strand are completely different than one another, but they are related to each other in that they're complementary to each other. So that there's a, for every place there's an A in the coding strand, there's a T in the template strand. And so, uh, you know, to, to produce uh, mRNA, which is the C strand, uh, one separates the two DNA strands and then an RNA polymerase um, produces that template by tri transcribing RNA from the template strand. And so let's just hear what Jim Watson thought about that, because when they discovered the structure, they didn't understand anything about the function. But uh, in fact, the structure uh, was self-explanatory almost. You'll hear how he explains it. Because when it's my job to learn, it's good reason to do it. The coding circuit was the code in the type of code, uh, not in the nucleus. So coding circuit was code removed from the chromosome, so it's being removed from the chromosome. Uh, it occurred on particles, uh, which contained RNA. So I thought there must be some case by which the information is transferred from DNA to RNA. And then RNA provides the information, it was a direct template for coding circuit. I looked at a little piece of paper, heaped it above my uh, desk. So, <clears throat> you, so he he used fundamental facts uh, and the structure to infer that uh, that the um, uh, the DNA must in have the information to produce protein. Okay, and so <clears throat> again, uh, we're looking at the sort of structure of the the DNA, and. Um, and that RNA transcript in green is shown below the DNA. And so uh, just so that we have terms, uh, the, uh, the first base of RNA is transcribed from a, a place in the DNA that's referred to by one of those terms, A, B, C, D, and E. So which one do you think is the, is the uh, where the first base of RNA is transcribed from? How does it, where does it start? Uh, anybody wanna call out an answer? Take a guess. You don't have to. Doesn't have to be right. So the first base of RNA is produced at which site in the DNA? Sorry. 
people are thinking A. Okay, so um, so that's not correct. So the origin is a, a structure in DNA at which DNA replication begins. So uh, take another guess. Try one more guess. Nobody wants to hazard a guess. Okay, so that's uh, you're all wrong. So the uh, the correct answer is the transcriptional start site. And just so that you know terms, and so you understand uh, terms, I'm not going to go through the definition of all of them. Uh, I have no idea what an activator site is. I made that up. Um, C is a, uh, the promoter is considered to be the region uh, near the the start site of transcription, where. <clears throat> Transcription factors and RNA polymerase recognizes sequences in the DNA. Uh, it's where basically the sequences are regulated, where transcription is regulated. But the actual first nucleotide uh, begins at the transcriptional start site. Okay, and so that's an important term to keep in mind when you think about the molecular biology of gene expression. Okay. Uh, it's option E. You don't, you don't see option E? Is the screen cut off? My, my what? <laughs> my pretty picture? Oh. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I, uh, that, that, that would be a problem. Okay. Anyway, let's move on because this is not uh, key to the, to the rest of the class. I just, uh, it's again, by way of background, transcription begins at the transcriptional start. So um, moving forward, if I can. Okay. Uh, so some more terms. I don't know if my picture is still in the wrong place. Can you see options A, A through E now? So, so after RNA is, hello? Okay, after RNA is produced, the RNA is translated into protein. And uh, <clears throat> so the messenger RNA has uh, a number of uh, features uh, in it that are listed A through E. And so the question is, what is the region between the start codon and the stop codon called? And so is it A? B, correct. Good. Okay. So now it helps to know that, that the answers are on the screen. Okay. So, so translation is an process. And so I have a little move by the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute. It's really informative and it really uh, captures of protein synthesis because, you know, in plants in particular, protein synthesis is the uh, element of whether crops are productive and they're producing useful products. And so translation is, is very important to understand. Here's a, a, a video. When the RNA copy is
controlled flow molecules from each of the 20 amino acids. Each transfer molecule carries a three-letter code that is matched to the R. You can't hear it? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just skip that then. It's, that, that video is a very um, kind of useful uh, image to show how ribosomes convert messenger RNA information into protein. And that's a, a, a very obviously a key important a, a key step in the synthesis of useful products from human from DNA. So the DNA then encodes the, the RNA. The RNA produces protein. Now, one uh, feature of RNA that's uh, off, or of protein synthesis that's not well uh, appreciated, I think, uh, is the concept of the fact that in order to produce enough protein. Uh, each messenger RNA is not just transcribed once, but it's transcribed by multiple messenger, uh, it, it's by multiple ribosomes. And so on a ribosome, if I, can you see my pointer when I move it on there? I, I don't know. Yes, okay. So uh, in this image, there's a messenger RNA shown here. This is an electron micrograph. And then these, th these blobs are those ribosomes. These are ribosomes in the cytoplasm translating um, um, proteins. And this image is shown uh, on this side is showing the ribosomes translating a messenger RNA, which is running along here. And these are pro individual ribosomes. And then you see coming off of each ribosome is the nascent, that is the growing peptide chain from the protein. And this image is an incredibly uh, detailed picture of how protein synthesis works. And you can see the ribosomes get on over here. This is at the five prime end of the messenger RNA. And they move along the RNA. And so what happens is here you can see small, small amount of translation has occurred on this ribosome. But by the time it traverses to the end, this protein gets quite large and is folded up into its mature form, even as it's being translated. So the concept, though, is that um, uh, in order to produce the amount of protein that's needed by the cell, one has to use uh, um, many, many ribosomes on each messenger RNA. So, for example, shown in the, in the movie, they showed the example of, you may, of uh, hemoglobin, red blood cell protein. Uh, and uh, in, in your body, you have to produce 100 trillion hemoglobin molecules every second. That is, every second you're alive, a hundred trillion have to be synthesized. And in order to do that, you need a lot of cells. So there's only about one, maybe one trillion cells or five trillion cells producing uh, hemoglobin. But that still means each cell has to make 10 to 100 proteins per second, which is incredibly fast if you think about it. You know, you saw that picture moving and, and that was moving roughly in, uh, in the, the speed that actually proteins are synthesized. So uh, the, the the only way to produce that amount of protein would be to produce many proteins from each mRNA singly. And so these, these structures where there's a messenger RNA with many ribosomes are referred to as polyribosomes. And uh, they, they're key to uh, producing the kind of protein that, say, a, a plant would need to produce all of the protein in a wheat, uh, in a wheat seed, for example. Okay. So, let's, moving forward. So, uh, I believe uh, probably you heard from Ravinder about splicing. If you have you spoken uh, about this in class? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm not going to go through this. Sorry. Okay. 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 So I'm not going to talk about anything about uh, RNA processing or its production. But just know that it's a complicated process, and that uh, you know that gene transcription is a very uh, complex and highly regulated process. And a number of uh, the features of uh, of gene transcription uh, are that uh, there all of this, the 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 RNA start site, the first RNA molecule, is added right here at this site, and that all of this DNA sequence upstream. And this upstream region can be quite large. It could be even up to millions of nucleotides between enhancers and the start site of transcription. All of those sequences are important, right? 
So that means that when you think about the human genome and doing mapping of the human genome and trying to understand how the structure of the human genome relates to gene expression, you can't just look at the gene. You can't look at just the protein coding region. You can't just look at the part that's spliced or translated, but you have to look at the entire structure, even far upstream of the gene. And it means that all of the DNA sequences then in the human genome are important. That's to say that, you know, uh, differences among individuals, polymorphisms that occur between individuals in sequences outside of the coding regions are important as well as the ones inside the coding region. Okay, so when thinking about that, it's important to, uh, uh, to, to remember that. Okay, so, you, so now you said you talked uh, about chromatin structure then? Okay, so uh, again, I'll just say a couple of things about chromatin structure again that uh, I'd just like you to remember then just to refresh your, uh, uh, your memories from the class that you uh, just heard. And that is that chromatin, chromatin modifications are very important and uh, they are these epigenetic things that happen outside of inheritance patterns and so forth uh, that have to do with modifications that occur in the DNA such as methylation and acetylation of histones and methylation of the DNA itself. And those modifications change the capacity of the DNA to produce proteins, right? And so all of these things are important and they're all uh, uh, encoded in the DNA structure. So understanding variation in the DNA structure uh, is important to understand how that variation can affect gene regulation. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the specific modifications then. We'll skip uh, skip this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and so um, so we'll, we'll go we'll go right through that. Okay. And so uh, and so now I'd like to cover a little bit now about how you inherit all of the information in the DNA because that's a, a key process in understanding anything about biology, about evolution, about gene expression, is that, uh, that um, DNA sequences are inherited in a very uh, uh, structured way. And so it's important to understand how that works. Okay, so, um, so as you probably all know, DNA is organized in all genomes of sort of higher eukaryotes, plants, and in humans, uh, in, in chromosomes. And uh, shown in this picture is a concept of a chromosome uh, as sort of a diagram shown here as metaphase chromosomes, that is chromosomes that are about to participate in either mitosis or meiosis. And what you can see is that on the left where it says one chromosome on the left, uh, you can see one chromatid and the chromatid has a centromere where uh, in the middle of the chromosome, which is the a location where uh, the two daughter cells that will divide will grab the chromosome and make sure that the chromosomes go to the correct cells. They have a structure at the end referred to as a telomere. Telomeres uh, were structures that were uh, um, discovered many years ago, but uh, are now the focus of intense investigation because they're deeply involved in, in uh, many disorders uh, such as cancer. And they're also deeply involved in aging. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty well known. It's, 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 commonly held that the length of your telomeres uh, is highly correlated with your age. And so that as you age, your telomeres get shorter and shorter. And people uh, believe, at least in part, that that shortening uh, contributes to, uh, to death uh, as you age. Anyway, so <clears throat> uh, an important concept, though, is that the chromosome that you see on the left side that says one chromosome is called a chromosome. And yet, the structure on the right where you see two chromatids is also called one chromosome. And so it, the difference between the, the left and the right is that the chromosome on the right has undergone DNA replication. And so what happens is this chromosome is completely copied and a perfect copy is made uh, of it. And so, and there, the perfect copy is connected to its source at the centromere. So both of these things are called one chromosome. And so people uh, often think of the thing on the right as two chromosomes, but it's not. So just remember that's one chromosome. Okay, it's a replicated form of the, uh, the chromosome on the left. Okay, so anyway, so uh, DNA in the cells are organized on chromosomes. 
uh, I'm sorry, and on, on chromosomes also is all of the DNA. So DNA, there's a single strand of DNA in humans, for example, that spans from the telomere on top over here to the telomere at the end here. And it's one single long piece of DNA. That one long piece of DNA in humans typically is on average about two times 10 to the eighth uh, base pairs in length. Uh, and uh, uh, each, uh, and there are um, 23 um, uh, pairs of chromosomes in every human. Okay, so, um, so it's important to realize uh, in this picture, you can see a picture of cr actual human chromosomes that are stained uh, in a way that, uh, that identifies actually repetitive sequences in the chromosomes. But it's important to realize that this structure that you see in these metaphase chromosomes, these are chromosomes prepared that, as cells are about to divide. Uh, these metaphase chromosomes have DNA that's always the same. So if they, let's just say the albumin gene is located at that position on chromosome one, that, that position on chromosome one will always be at that position. It's not that the albumin gene can one time be here and another time be up here. And it's always at exactly the same position in the chromosome. So the structure of the chromosome is basically an ordered linear array of every gene on that chromosome. So when you think about mapping genes, then it's important to realize that you could use chromosome structures to map genes. And so uh, some of the most important kinds of uh, chromosomal mapping uh, strategies involve looking at chromosomes in the microscope and then seeing if they're completely intact and they have all of their pieces. And you could identify the pieces because these bands that you see here uh, are, as I said, are, are identifying repetitive sequences in, in the DNA. Uh, and that, um, that banding pattern is identical from one cell to another uh, across uh, all cells in every organism. And so uh, it's very easy to tell, for example, if a band is missing here. Okay, so, um, so we, uh, one thing you can see in this picture is this circle red thing here on chromosome 21. And what's, what, why do I circle chromosome 21? What do you see about chromosome 21 that's different than all of the other chromosomes in this picture? Anybody have a thought? Down syndrome, that's right. What is Down syndrome? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that is Down syndrome. And what is Down syndrome? Any? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. It's, it's shown here in the picture. So, 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 uh, so yeah, so there's an extra chromosome 21 in people with Down syndrome, right? So this, you can see that every chromosome in this picture, which came from a single cell of a single person, Every chromosome has two copies. Uh, and uh, the important thing is each copy, the copy on the left uh, comes from one parent and the copy on the right comes from the other parent. So in diploid organisms like plants or people, uh, every, every uh, cell has uh, uh, equal composition of chromosomes that came from the mother and, uh, and from the father. Okay, and so that's an important uh, feature of normal chromosomes, but in Down syndrome, something has happened here where there's uh, an extra chromosome 21. And in Down syndrome individuals, you could see that uh, 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 children, for example, who have Down syndrome have a characteristic phenotype that's a little bit different, right? You can see they have a characteristic facial, facial features, they tend to have short stature, uh, and they tend to have uh, cognitive uh, um, abnormalities anyway. And so uh, it, after studying Down syndrome for many years, and uh, you'll, you'll note that uh, Ravinder uh, is actually spends a lot of time, has spent some time
I'm studying chromosome 21 and Down syndrome, uh, DNA. You lose half of the complexity of your, uh, of your genome. So, um, so uh, as I said, so what happens after meiosis is you form gametes, and um, gametes do not have homologous chromosomes anymore. And so I, I think on the next slide, uh, there's a cartoon of this. And so uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do this by talking through it. So uh, it's important to understand meiosis because it's the basis of all uh, genetics, okay? So it's very important to have a concept of how it works. And so normal cells look like this one. And in this cell, I'm showing two chromosomes, chromosome one and chromosome two. And uh, by color, I'm showing the, the mother is in the, uh, is in the, the fuchsia color, the, the, perp, the pink color, uh, and the father's chromosomes are shown in the green color. And these chromosomes, th these, uh, this chromosome came from the father, this from the mother, father, uh, f father, mother. Okay, and so the question is, uh, so in this particular picture, I'm not gonna, we won't do this as a question. In this particular picture, this is a diploid cell, and it's diploid because it has two of each chromosome. So every single chromosome, and remember there's 23 chromosomes in humans, every single chromosome uh, exists in two copies, and they're not identical. They're very, very similar to each other, but they're not identical. This one came from your father, and this one came, this one came from your father, and this one came from your mother. Okay, and so it's uh, referred to as a diploid cell. Okay, then following meiosis, meiosis goes, uh, proceeds in two sort of phases. One is referred to as meiosis one. And at the end of meiosis one, this cell divides and produces two cells. And uh, is, this, if, is this cell a diploid or a haploid cell? Anybody wanna call out? Correct. So this one, this cell is haploid, and it's haploid because this cell has received only one set of the two chromosomes that were available in this cell. So in this case, it received two green cells from this cell, and so therefore, it's haploid, and it it no longer has the same diversity of genes that the original cell had. So for example, if on this cell there were a mutation here at this position called A, let's say A is a gene that encodes something important. There is a mutation in this chromosome for A, but in this chromosome, it's got no mutation. Uh, th this chromosome would be different than this one, and this meiotic product would only contain the mutant gene. It wouldn't contain a copy of the normal gene. So that if this were then passed on to the progeny, that progeny would receive a mutant gene from its parent because it received uh, the, the, uh, this, this mutant allele. And similarly, this cell received a normal allele. So the important thing in terms of genetics is that, number one, chromosomes assort randomly, right? And so I show in this picture two green chromosomes, but in fact, it could have been, it could have taken the, the chromosome one, it could have taken the green one, and it could have taken chromosome number two uh, here instead of the green one. So it could have had this chromosome plus this chromosome here, and then conversely, this chromosome and this chromosome would have gone here. So this process of assortment of chromosomes is, is uh, uh, one of the, uh, the laws that Gregor Mendel out in his original genetic studies on peas. And it's basically the concept of random assortment of chromosomes. And this random assortment of chromosomes uh, is quite, uh, it leads to a lot of diversity. So after this first step, if in humans, there are 23 chromosomes. There's two. There's uh, two to the 23rd possible combinations of chromosomes. Then, and so it means that you get a huge amount of diversity just by uh, this random assortment of chromosomes. Okay, so you don't need mutations. You don't need anything else. Just random assortment. Right. And so then, in the the last step of meiosis, the two replicated homologs separate into, the, into uh, separate uh, cells, and these separate uh, cell types contain only one of, oops, I'm sorry. It's the problem of using the pointer to uh, change slides. Uh, so uh, they contain uh, uh, only one of the two replicated uh, chromosomes. 
in this case, this chromosome should be identical to this chromosome because it was uh, derived by DNA replication of the chromosome. Okay, so the process of meiosis then, you start out with a diploid cell and you end up with four uh, separate cells. Each one uh, is packaged into a gamete and each gamete then can be uh, uh, fertilize an egg if it's a sperm, or if it's an egg, it can be fertilized by a sperm. And upon fertilization, it receives a cell like this from the other parent of the couple that's mating, and it produces an, a diploid cell then by mating. So it's sort of the cycle goes back to here. Okay. Okay, so uh, in meiosis then, meiosis is a source of tremendous diversity. Uh, and I, I just wanted to go ahead, sorry. Uh, I can't go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go back. Okay, so in meiosis, um, I, I think uh, the person who answered the question about uh, uh, chromosomes before talked a little bit about recombination. And so in meiosis, oh, sorry. So in meiosis, um, recombination uh, can occur uh, at uh, numerous steps along the way here. But if recombination occurs, what will happen in a, in a recombination event is that this chromosome from the father, remember this is the chromosome from, the, from your father. So if you think about human generations, uh, your parents, uh, each parent of, of yours contributed either this chromosome or this chromosome, and that's what's present in your gametes. And now when you produce gametes and you produce these cells down here, uh, recombination allows uh, sequences on this chromosome to line up with sequences on this chromosome and recombine. And so uh, you could end up with a cell at this stage where you have, say, half of the pink chromosome and half of the green chromosome uh, uh, located here. And so that recombination event adds a tremendous amount of extra diversity because now it's not just random assortment of chromosomes that gives diversity. 